Good evening. Welcome to our special town hall, Your Voice, Your Future town hall conversation with Congressman John Katko. We are broadcasting live tonight from the campus of Onondaga Community College inside Store Hall, where a number of constituents from the 24th Congressional District have gathered. They are all here and they all have questions for Congressman Katko, who has not held a town hall since the last election. That all changes tonight and it's happening live right here. It's worth noting that I'm Matt Mulcahy with Megan Coleman and Michael Benny from NBC3 and CBS5. The audience tonight was selected as a lottery out of some 600 people who were interested in being here tonight. The size of the audience limited by the congressman's wishes and also the size of the room. Now over the last hour we randomly selected the order the audience will ask questions. If at any point someone needs to be removed that will be done by OCC security. Now that we have the rules out of the way and set the tone for the evening let's get things started. A warm welcome tonight for Congressman John Katko. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Hi, Matt. Good to see you. Hi, Megan. Yeah. How are you? What's going on, Matt? All right. Good to see you. Congressman Katko, we appreciate you being here. I know the whole audience has a lot to ask you, so we want to get things rolling right off the bat. A couple of opening, re opening remarks from you. Sure, I just want to thank uh, Channel 3 and 5, CNY Central, for having me here tonight and engaging in his most uh, democratic version of uh, the, the American process. So uh, I thank you all for taking time out of your schedule tonight and being here. I know it's a lot to be here, and I'm looking forward to he hearing from you. And. Uh, whether you think so or not, I absolutely learn from you. I learn from protesters. I learn from my supporters. I learn from people who agree with me. And I learn from people who disagree with me. So no hard feelings. Speak your mind. Let's have a discussion tonight, and uh, let's get at it. So with that, Matt, I'm ready to go. All right, Congressman, and we are ready to go as well. We have our first question from Nancy, and she has a question. She's going to direct it right at you here tonight. Nancy, take it away. Hi, Nancy. Hi. Congressman, um, first off, I would like to say thank you for having this town hall, and I hope you have more and larger ones in the near future. Um, there are three areas of the Trump proposed budget that I would like reinstated. Uh, they include Meals on Wheels, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Environmental Protection Agency. Okay. What three areas would you be interested in changing and why? All of them, because I could, quite frankly, I, my mother did Neils on Wheels for 20 years, and I, part I went with her at times, I went, with, with her with, as, I went by myself since I've been in Congress. I've done it many times. I have friends that do an awful lot of volunteer work for Meals on Wheels, including one of my neighbors and a retired FBI agent, and have an immense amount of respect for them. Uh, the, Public-private partnership, which Meals on Wheels represents, is the best form of government I can see. The government provides the funding and gets out of the way and lets these people do the great work. And when you bring a meal to someone that's at home, you allow them to stay at home longer and you allow them to have a, have a better quality of life at a, for a longer period of time. My mother-in-law enjoyed Meals on Wheels for quite a while when she lived in a rural area, and it was great. And so I strongly support that. As far as endowment for the arts, I'm a very strong supporter of that as well. I believe that we need that. I believe that you know, the cultural integration and the things that it represents are wonderful. And I think it's something we should do. And the last one, I'm sorry, was... Uh, environmental. environmental. Oh, yes, EPA. Yes, the EPA, there's a lot of concerns out there. The EPA was going to be abolished. Uh, they were going to slash your budget to terrible, make it, a, make it a debilitating budget. Well, none of that happened. And everything you just asked about, came from the president's budget, right? And presidents in modern times have basically taken the budget and sent it up to Capitol Hill as a wish list of their priorities. But what people have got to remember is that the budget is a function of Congress, not the president. And I, I'm happy to tell you that we just did the budget. It just passed. The president just signed it. And none of the cuts we was talking about to any of those agencies happened. So it's, it's proof positive that Congress can control the process and we're going to make sure that we keep those things funded properly going forward. Mm -hmm. Now, the last thing I'll say is we have to um, be mindful of the fact that we can't spend, spend, spend with this government. We have to, with a scalpel, surgically find places we can save money, and we've got to endeavor to do that with any program, including those. Congressman Scott from Baldwinsville joins us now. He has a question. You mentioned uh, the EPA and the environment. Scott likes to, wanna, wants to ask a little more about that. Hi, Scott. How yes. are you? I'm concerned that the uh, Republican Congress and the President are so into rolling back the environmental protections that have been built up over the last 30, 50 years. 
And we're going to end up again with lakes like Onondaga Lake that has spent, we spent billions of dollars trying to resurrect and is just barely coming back to life. Right. So I'd like to know your words, uh, your sure. thoughts on that. Sure, Scott, let me ask if I may quickly. Are you from Syracuse? Did you grow up here? I'm from Beeville, yes okay. I have. So I you like me. I drive past the lake and used to stink the high heaven. Yep. I'm thrilled it is coming back the way it is, but it's a great cause. One of the things that profoundly affected me growing up, Scott, you can sit down and relax, man, don't worry, it's my time to work. Um, uh, one of the things that profoundly affected me growing up was when my dad used to take me to hockey games or take me somewhere in the car on a Saturday morning early, you'd go down 690 uh, past the fairgrounds and way into the city. You remember the ramp that went over the highway? And at the end of the ramp, they had a big tube and this brown crap came out of there. And I'm like, what is that stuff? And I never understood, even at a young age, why our forefathers let that place get so polluted. And that profoundly affected me. And so moving forward, I am gonna uh, be a, uh, be a work on uh, making sure that we don't roll back all the environmental progress we've made. And I don't think we will. But let me give you an example. The Brownfields legislation, Brownfields is a program which provides federal funding to clean up hazardous waste sites, right? And I just introduced a bill to continue funding of it and enhance funding for brownfields because all over my district, our district, your district, there is all kinds of brownfield sites that have been re reclaimed because of the brownfield program. So I'm a big believer in that. I've also uh, signed on to what not a, ton of Demo not a ton of Republicans have, and it's called the climate resolution. The last term it was the Gibson climate resolution. This term, uh, Congresswoman Stefanik signed on to it as well. It's about 15 of us Republicans saying, climate change is real, and man's contributed to it. And we must be mindful of that moving forward in the programs that we enter into. So I absolutely believe in the climate stuff. I absolutely believe in shifting tax credits from fossil fuels to renewables, and like wind energy and solar, right? And I also, thank you. I wasn't sure I was gonna get many claps tonight, so this is encouraging. But, uh, so one of the things I did with it, you notice with the nuclear power plants up in Oswego, at first blush you may think, oh no, nuclear. But nuclear is 100% clean, uh, clean emissions, no carbon at all emitted in the atmosphere. And until such time as the renewables can stand on their own two feet to sustain us as an, as an economy, we need clean sources of energy. I would respectfully submit that's one of them is to pro provide a bridge. But we've got to get to the point where we can have renewables. One great thing we can leave our kids in our, our, ki our children's children is renewables that function to provide all the power we need. Until such time, let's keep trying to find ways to keep your environment as clean as possible. And thank you for your question. Congressman, I am with Tess from Wayne County, T uh, Tess from Wayne County, and she has a question for you tonight about President Trump's travel ban. I, you know, I didn't think we were going to have any qu uh, questions on Trump tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I strongly oppose a Muslim ban. Do you, yes or no, and why? Oh yeah, we, we can, listen, we cannot restrict people coming into this country based on their race, based on their color, based on their sex, or religious orientation, or any of those things. We can't do that. <clears throat> but just take a step back, okay? Um, was that executive order he, he doled out, was that clumsily handled? Absolutely, absolutely call it a rookie mistake or whatever, but look at the intent behind it. And I can talk about this with some degree of intelligence because I work on Homeland Security every day and in Congress, I'm on the committee, and I get briefed in the basement of the Capitol and literally in a lead-lined lead room about the bad things that people want to do to us, right? And whether we want to believe it or not, people want to do us serious harm, and it's frightening some of the, some of the plots have been uncovered that you can't talk about in a non-classified setting. But the bottom line is this, okay? ISIS and Al-Qaeda want to infiltrate the West through the, through the refugee process. They've been successful in doing it in Paris when tons of people were killed in those horrific incidents, and in Brussels at the airport that was blown up. It's terrible stuff, okay? In 2012 or so, a gentleman came in from Iraq as a refugee, and after he was here, it was found that his fingerprints were on roadside bombs that killed our soldiers in Afghanistan, I think it was Afghanistan and Iraq, one of the two. So then they started investigating him. And after they found, they investigated him, they found out him and another refugee um, were engaged in a plot to do some serious damage here in the United States from a terrorism standpoint. But also, uh, they were aiding ISIS abroad. They both pled guilty, they're in prison now. So it's real, the threat's serious, we have to take it right. I applaud the president for trying to do something about it. 
and we got to we got to find a proper balance. And the last thing I'll say is, I've spoken with all the refugee centers, and I've become friends with guys like Yusuf over at the Northside Learning Center and the Interfaith Works people and Catholic Charities, Mike Millar and all them, and they all say the same thing, and the same thing I maintain. I have no problem with refugees, so long as they're properly vetted. If they're properly vetted, I have no problem with it, but we can't cut corners. And what we found out was, the last administration was cutting corners because they couldn't verify certain information, and that's a dangerous thing. So as long as, as long as we can streamline the process, we are gonna be okay. And I, these people I talk with and these agencies agree with me, and we work with them. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Congressman. Uh, our thank next you. question comes from Kevin in Baldwinsville. He's, he's concerned we've certainly seen a lot of floodwaters this spring, but you have your own question about that, Kevin. Yeah, yes. Um, first question is, we have an issue in Lysander with the FEMA floodplain map having an error in it. You're not alone, and, my friend. Okay. You're not alone. And I was just concerned with the people, they're spending their own money to try to correct that, and FEMA has been hard to get a hold of. I know we've contacted you. Mm -hmm. Is how, how is there that much bureaucracy that we can't get through to the right people to get that taken care of without an expense to the homeowners? Here, here's the problem with the FEMA flood mapping, right? Uh, for, for those of you who don't, may not know, about 10 years ago, FEMA started a, pro, a program where they re redid the flood mapping nationwide. And then, if you're within a floodplain, you must have ins flood insurance. It's not a choice. Now, if your chance of having a flood is once in every 100 years, as opposed to a $10 million house sitting on a shore somewhere, right? That's most certainly gonna get flooded at some point because where it was built, it really doesn't matter. And it's not fair. It's very expensive flood insurance, as you know. And it makes some people hard, it's hard for some people to get rid of their homes and sell their homes. And it's hard to get a mortgage sometimes because you gotta pay a lot of money for this insurance every year. And we just went down to talk about this in the city of Syracuse this summer, last summer. It was a, it's a nightmare. It's 10 years in the making. And it's 10 years of FEMA through bureaucracy, picking out floodplains and picking out what, where they, they did it on a scientific basis. And they tried to do it the right way, but the bottom line is I think it's a deeply flawed program. When you're in the city of Syracuse and perhaps one-tenth of the value of your home is being paid for insurance every year, whereas a guy that has a $10 million house on the ocean is not paying one-tenth of the value of that house for insurance, something's wrong. And so we're trying to look at that and see how we can fix that. Once they make the designation, there's an appeals process, and I encourage anyone that has this, come to call our office and we will help you with the appeals process. But I'm not gonna give you like a, a uh, optimistic view that the appeals process will go smoothly. It's tough, it's tough. But the bottom line is we're trying to make some changes in the FEMA process. I think it's patently unfair that people in the city of Syracuse who virtually never see flooding and are trying to hang on to their homes are getting screwed with about 10% value a year in insurance for flood insurance, which they never had before. It's forcing them out of their homes. It's just not right. Congressman, thank you. Yes. We want to turn to social media tonight because uh, there are a number of people who are here in the sure. audience, but there are many more who are watching this broadcast live at home and they are also watching on our social media channels. Our question tonight comes from Pete. We're going to have our producer repeat that for us, please. After learning that President Trump shared, after learning that President Trump shared highly classified information, will you call for an independent investigation? Highly classified information regarding what? Because I saw some just before I came in Reg here tonight. I'm sorry, regarding ISIS. Oh, regarding ISIS. Thank you. Um, listen, um, we had... With Russia. With Russia. Oh, with Russia. With Russia. Russia. Yes, that just came out before I came out tonight, and I just heard about that. We gotta take a look at what happens. I also read in the same article just before I came out, the Wall Street Journal said at the end of that article that it may be the president's prerogative to de declassify whatever he wants to. Uh, but, uh, hang on, hang on. Don't shoot. Don't shoot the messenger, I'm just saying what I've read in the paper, okay? So no, but, but with that, with that I say that of course we should look into that. Of course we don't turn a blind eye to that. We, we gotta handle sensitive information like that in the proper manner, and we should and we must. The House and Senate Intelligence Committees are looking into the Russia matter right now, okay? 
independent. Let me finish. Let me finish. The, ho the House and Senate Intelligence Committees are looking in this matter. Those are two very bipartisan committees, right? And you have the. Uh, hang on. Nunez was. Re that's a great example. Someone said Nunez. Nunez was removed from the committee and removed from, the, from it because he was viewed as something of not, less than being bipartisan. He was replaced by someone in control of Republicans who's bipartisan. By all accounts, the Senate House Intelligence Committee and the uh, Senate and House Intelligence Committees are doing their job. And as a prosecutor, I will tell you, okay, when you make charging decisions and you make decisions based on emotion, you make the wrong decision. We got to let them develop the facts and let the facts tell us. If they get done with their investigation and they say, we recommend an independent prosecutor, heck yeah. We recommend, recommend an independent panel, I will agree with them. But we've got to let them develop the facts. But I will support whatever they conclude in a bipartisan manner. You haven't heard them coming out and saying, this is all a mess and this isn't working. They're working together. Senator Warner. They don't have resources. <clears throat> they are working. When it gets to the point where they tell us, that this needs, needs to be done, I, I will respect that and I will abide by that. But we've got to let them do their work. You've got to have faith in these folks that they know what they're doing. Congressman, thank you. Let's, uh, let's move on. Congressman, I have a gentleman here from Oswego. It's right up the center and his name is Chad. He has a question for you. And we're going to stick on the topic of Russia right now. Hi, Congressman. Hi, Chad. Thank How you are you? Thanks for thank coming you. tonight. I wanted to give you a little positionality on my part before I ask a question. And, a little what, I'm sorry? Uh, positionality. In 20 years, um, you were the first Republican that I voted for. And I did that because... Well, I'm going to applaud you on that oh, one. <laughs> I, I did that um, because I thought you were a, a person of integrity. I respect your record of um, keeping Central New York safe as a prosecutor. Um, and I respected your um, bipartisan record, your strong bipartisan record. And right now, I think we need some more integrity um, in D.C. And I'm going to get the elephant out of the room. This president is not well. And with, with other Republicans in the Senate, especially um, John McCain, uh, Lindsey Graham, who have stood up and um, question this president and his actions, his demeanor, um, his lack of respect for others. Um, I want to know what you plan to do to see that um, this president is held to um, a higher standard. Okay. Yeah, thank you for the question. And, uh, and I, I can only tell you that actions speak louder than words. All right. What is the biggest vote that we've had in Congress this year, the biggest priority for the president so far? Healthcare. Healthcare reform. And what did I do in that? No. Right. Okay. I love my party, and I believe in the fiscal conservatism, and I believe in smaller government. But I also believe there's a right way to do things and a wrong way to do things, and that's why I voted the way I did on that health care bill. And if that's not an indication of my ability, my desire, and my guts to stand up to people, then I don't know what is. Because you want to talk about pressure that was brought to bear on people in that vote? It was incredible. But I didn't buckle. And now, if the Senate, and, thank you. But if the House and Senate Intelligence Committees come back and make recommendations, I'll abide by them. Okay, but we got to let the facts go where they go. Okay, and we got to, you have to make a case. Listen, I knew the Bricktown was a gang, for example, when I was doing gang cases. I knew it, I just didn't want to indict them. I spent a year to a year and a half in every gang I prosecuted developing the evidence, making my case, dotting my I's and crossing my T's. That's how you make your case. And I'm not saying that the president's guilty of anything. I'm not saying he's not guilty of anything. We got to look in, and, and that's our job as overseers of the executive branch to do that. And they are doing it, and we will do that, and we will make our decisions accordingly. But you can tell me, right, I appreciate your vote, and I know I got, I got to earn it every time, like with everybody else out there. And I can tell you this much. I am still considered one of the most independent members in all of Congress, and I'll do what's right for my, my constituents first and my constituents always. You're number 14. Okay, and that's not bad out of 435. <laughs> Thank you, Congressman. Folks, folks, I need, I need to interject. It's about 20 minutes into this, 
in general. We've had great questions. The congressman's answering them, but we can't take every question that's shouted out from the audience to change the topic of conversation. He's been responsive to some of the comments that have been shouted out. Appreciate that. No problem. But we also have to respect some process here, too. Uh, Kitty from Matisco is next. She has a question about climate change tonight. Kitty, how are you? Uh, I'm fine. How are you? Good. How are you? Um, good, Congressman. Thanks. I grew um, up with my dad fishing on a Tisco Lake. I love that lake. It's awesome. I live on over the hill from the lake. So. Okay. Um, okay. I, I want to say first that I'm very glad you're not a climate denier. Um, I've been really frightened, however, by the Republican actions to dismantle the policies that we've had in place to fight climate change. Okay, I'm sure you know that the earth is warming faster than it was expected to. Um, this is a real crisis. And I don't see Republicans in general dealing with that. In fact, I see them doing the opposite. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my question to you is threefold. First, what do you personally plan to do in Congress to lead toward a reduction in greenhouse gases and an increase in renewable energy? Second, how do you personally plan to help stop the assault on climate science and the EPA led by President Trump, Mr. Tr Mr. Pruitt, and other Republicans? And third, do you support keeping our commitment to the Paris Climate Accord? Okay. Thank you, Kitty. Thank you. I'll try to remember all three of those, but I'm, not, I'm terrible, but I don't write things down, so I apologize. But I'll talk generally about what, what your concerns are. First of all, I already told you that I, I, I was with a number, a handful of Republicans who signed on to a thing acknowledging that global warming is, is or a, a climate change is an issue and a man has contributed in some way and we got to do something about that. And I've engaged and I can't tell you how many hours of meetings, talks, discussions in my office and all over Washington about the climate issue, right? Um, as far as the, the Paris Accords go, here's my problem with that, okay? It may have a perverse incentive and I'll tell you why, all right? When you have an agreement that is voluntary compliance, it's rife to be screwed with, right? So just let me finish, okay? Um, so let me give you an example. If we had an enforceable worldwide agreement that was truly enforceable in whatever way we, mechanism you could find, and I, you know, I have some ideas perhaps like uh, um, uh, if you buy products from a company that it is polluting the environment, they get a big surcharge on them, something like that. But we could, we could somehow make it enforceable, I think it'd be great. So whether or not we pull out of the Paris Accords is, is uh, my, my, my concern is we gotta make those agreements enforceable because I believe that's the only way to do it. Think about it. What incentive is Russia for Russia, still a developing country, or Brazil, whose economy is tanked because gas has gone down, or India, which is still a developing country, or China, the four major polluters in the world by far. What's their incentive to get involved with that? If we put all these onerous regulations on us unilaterally here in the United States and they don't follow them, It'll, co it'll cost more and more to make goods here, and then they'll, they'll say, I'm not gonna do that. I would much rather see a global agreement that we can all, and we can have enforceable. That's not to say I don't think the Paris Accord has some good stuff to it, it does. But the bottom line is, there is a fine line between leading and being responsible stewards, which I believe we are here, and I believe we should continue to do, and we can always do better, but Making it enforceable for other countries is the best way to not cut off our nose to spite our face. But we're not enforcing it if we pull out of it. No, that's the second part of it. That's the second part of it, okay? If we, if we pull out of it. Now, let's talk about the EPA. Let's talk about the other things that people are concerned about, okay? All right? I just gave you an example of the proposed cuts in the president's budget that was sent to Capitol Hill and what actually happened with the EPA, right? What about the scientists who were just dumped from the... the Okay, but well, that's one step at a time here, okay? So the EPA, there's so much concern about the EPA. The EPA is still in existence. They're still operating, still doing their job, but, and they still have their budget. So the biggest concern we thought was that it wasn't gonna happen. It wasn't gonna exist, it was gonna get put out of existence. It didn't happen. In effect, it is being taken out of existence. Well, I, I, I respectfully disagree based on the funding levels we sent, sent We're there. We're gonna have to move on. <clears throat> Thank you, Congressman, and thank you for the question, uh, um, and thank you for following up on the question. Uh, let's talk to Tricia from Manlius. She has a legal pad full of questions, oh and boy. she has kept her the one that she is choosing secret 
until right now, Tricia. Hi, Congressman. Thank you for being here. And thank you for being here as well. Um, I did a little research, obviously, before attending here tonight. And That's I, quite obvious. <laughs> <laughs> we were, I was looking at a lot of the recent polling information that comes out, and there was Rasmussen and Quinnipiac, Gallup, NBC, and the Wall Street Journal polls. All of these polls, and this is the most recent data, I think the, the oldest one was came out on the 10th of this month, all of these polls have disapproval ratings for President Trump between 54 and 58 um, percent. And this is on the general overall, how do you think he's doing question, not on specific policy mm -hmm. issues. Question. The numbers change depending on your party affiliation, of course. But if one of those polling institutes called you today and asked, do you approve or disapprove of how President Trump is doing, what would your answer be? That's a great question. That's a great question. <laughs> and here's how I would answer it. I wouldn't be able to say approve or disapprove, okay? Here's what I would answer. Okay. Well, I'm going to tell you what I'm, I'm going to tell you my take on this present. That's the, gen that's the genesis of your question, okay? And that's the question, okay? And that's the answer you're going to get. And that is this, okay? I applaud the, this guy for running two issues instead of running away from them. Okay? No one, no one wanted to, uh, they, Republicans said seven or eight years to do something about health care and they did nothing. So, did he, did he, did he stub his toe? Did he stub his toe? Yes. Did he run to the issue? Did he try to do something about it? Yes. He is trying to do something about tax reform, which we haven't had in a generation, in which we badly need to bring jobs back to the U.S. And we badly need to level the playing field with our international partners. And God, Lord knows the middle, middle class families and lower income families are getting taxed to death. I applaud him for that, okay? And I applaud the fact that he wants to do something about infrastructure. And Lord knows infrastructure in this country is badly hurt. hurt. Okay, I have some concerns. Can you please let me finish? Folks, folks, folks. Fake news. <laughs> so, to finish my thought, okay, do I have some concerns about some of the things that happened? Of course, okay? That's why I said we need to look into the whole Russian thing from both sides and look at it, of course. So I can't give you a straight answer because I, there's too much there. But the bottom line is there's a lot to be happy with this guy and there's some things to be concerned about. All right. All right, thank you, Congressman, for that answer. Thank you. And, and thanks to the audience. You're showing passion. We do appreciate that. While we try to contain there's order, too. There's lots of passion here tonight. There's a lot of passion. <laughs> Uh, and I know there's more passion to come. Uh, Gary from Camillus has a question about net neutrality. Gary. Thank you for coming, Congressman. I appreciate your uh, taking my question. Sure. I've got a question about what your thought process is with the net neutrality bill that's um, being, or, or the law that's coming up in front of Congress, and also on your past votes on the internet providers. I want to make sure I understand the, the, which question you're talking about because the, the net, just give me a little bit more detail about the net neutrality. I know what you're talking about with the other question, but can you tell me what you're talking about with net neutrality? Well, what is, your, what is your thought process on net neutrality? Are you for or against it? Quite frankly, I haven't spent a lot of time with that particular issue. I, I must confess. Okay, and then the other, well, the other but part the other of the question is, is with the providers being allowed to sell the consumer data. Yeah, okay, now, no. that's a big problem, and I want... So I'll answer your question now. Um, so here's the deal with that, with, that, with that issue. The Federal Trade Commission has primary jurisdiction over uh, monitoring the internet, right? Okay. And so in the 11th hour of the Obama administration, as they were leaving, they passed a ton of regulations, including this one. This one gave the Federal Communications Commission, instead of the Federal Trade Commission, sort of jurisdiction over part of the internet. And it's caused a mess. And that mess is, they said, you, internet service providers, that being like the AT&T of the world, Verizon's uh, the internet service providers, Time Warner, those types of things, right? They said, you can't take data that's generated by people using search, you know, searching on the internet to, for, for whatever reason. You can, that's, that's private. You can't do that. I agree with that. But here's what I don't agree with. 
Who are the two biggest violators far and away, the biggest, biggest users of private data? Google and Facebook. And guess what they accepted out of the deal? Google and Facebook. It's not right. Two things I have a problem with the bill. Number one, it didn't include all the, internet, all the people who use that data. And number two, it kind of made jurisdiction confusing for the FCC, Federal Trade Commission, excuse me. So I support keeping that data out, but I voted no against that. I voted, I voted to repeal that particular order because it was confusing. It only allowed, it, it gave a competitive disadvantage to Google and Facebook, gave them no ability or no desire to want to change their thinking because now they have a bigger competitive advantage. They can make more money doing it because they have the data, the others don't. I think we should have a rule that deals with privacy issues for all of them. I support that and I've, and I've supported legislation for that and I've made, an, made, interesting, made my interest known in that going forward. So that's a good example, but on its face looks like, why the heck did he vote for that? But when I have an opportunity to explain it, and I thank you for asking that question, it gave me an opportunity to show you that uh, there is a rationale behind it, and that's it. I absolutely think that it's wrong that people, when they search the internet, are having their information monitored and used for commercial purposes. And that shouldn't happen without people having the ability to say, yeah, it's okay with me, or no, it's not. So the rule that, that, that was part of that should be applied to everyone and the cross line, and the FTC should implement it. Congressman, I'm with Rodney from East Syracuse. Oh, there you are. We are right here. He uh, is a multimedia kind of guy. He's uh, live streaming this on his YouTube channel as well. That's pretty he cool. has a question for you tonight about North Korea. Sure. Yes, Mr. Kako, um, as you may have heard, North Korea has been, has been in the news a lot lately. So what are your, what's your position on um, a possible military action if they continue to proceed of them trying to, one, develop their nuclear program, and two, do you have any plans of how the military can try to stop them from, because the last thing that we want is to have North Korea having nukes here, you know what I'm saying? You're absolutely right, my friend. And by the way, the name's John, it's not Mr. Kako, okay? All right, so now, with respect to North Korea, and I can tell you, it's, in my opinion, one of the most profound issues we face today, by far. It is an existential, existential threat to our existence. And what happened the other day was truly troubling because they had a major advancement in, their, in the ballistic missiles that now makes it look like they might be able to go a lot farther to deliver their nuclear warheads than just to see a Japan. And I say just to see Japan, I don't mean that like it's nothing. But in other words, to hit us, okay? And so I'm very concerned. So what do we do, right? I got one word for you, and it's China. The key is China. China needs to be engaged because China has been sort of the protector for North Korea all this time. I think China is starting to figure out that um, uh, they, they got a real problem on their hands. Now China doesn't want to take out the dictator because what's going to happen is everyone's going to flee China and come streaming into, uh, or flee North Korea and come streaming into China, then they've got a big humanitarian crisis on their hands. And that's why I think what the President Trump did in meeting with the Chinese leader early and engaging him early was critically important, it was a really good move. Because if you notice afterwards, China's a little different now towards North Korea. They put 150,000 other troops on the North Korean border. And if you don't know, the North Korean border is like this, China's like over it like this. They put a lot of troops on the, northern, on the North Korea's border. They've also canceled a lot of coal shipments from, from North Korea as kind of a sanction. Okay, so North Korea realized they've got to do something, or China realized it's got to do something about North Korea. So I think China is the key. We need to engage in diplomacy at all, all costs. We really do with, with China, and I think China will be the key going forward. Now, and I don't mean to scare everybody, because every time I talk about Homeland Security or these types of things, people get depressed, but the bottom line is, right around the corner is another, another problem, and it's Iran. In 1994, we entered into an agreement similar to the Iran one, with North Korea, and they wouldn't, so that we wouldn't, they wouldn't have nuclear weapons. Then uh, North Korea now has them, obviously. And I'm afraid with Iran, the same thing's going to happen. So we need to monitor that situation very closely too, and keep an eye on it because th it is a real issue. And uh, I worry about it because my son as well, from a personal standpoint, he just graduated from Geneseo Saturday, and next Saturday he gets sworn in as the second lieutenant in the army. Thank you. And, I get to swear them in and I'm very proud of that and excited. There's no way I'll be able to keep a dry eye. But the bottom line is, you gotta remember, there's 30,000 troops on, in the DMZ between North and South Korea, American troops, that are gonna be directly at harm's way if this thing breaks bad. And so we've gotta really work hard on a the, on the diplomatic solution through China. John, I know that you're, um, 
the, the president could use those three American hostages as as part of the process here too. Oh sure, sure. He's he's going to do that. Congressman, thank you. Thank you. Uh, via social media for the last week, we've been soliciting uh, questions for folks who can't be here tonight in person. So let's take this one from Melanie, who wrote in via Facebook. How do you plan to continue making sure Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia stay a federal priority? How do you do that? We already did it. And <clears throat> I can tell you from a very personal standpoint, it's the highest priority for me. My dad is in a nursing home now <coughs> here in Syracuse, and he's, in the, and he's in, the, in the tough stages of Alzheimer's. It's a horrible disease. His mind is not where it should be, but his body's okay. And there's times where he doesn't know us. And we have a big, loving family. We get together every, all, all the time, like we did yesterday and for, for Sunday. Uh, and uh, it's really hard. And what we did last year was something that, these are the things that people don't really notice. But you should be damn proud to be an American when you hear about them, okay? There's something called 21st Century Cures. And it, what it did is it plussed up spending to the National Institutes of Health to find targeted cures for these things. Uh, Alzheimer's, heart disease, uh, cancer. The big, the big cost drivers of our health care, the major cost drivers. They project over the next 30 years that Alzheimer's will cost countless trillions of dollars to Medicare alone. Think about that. If you find a cure to that, what would happen? It'd be amazing, the, the cost of health care. And heart disease, the same way, and cancer. And they're already making advances. So what we told National Institutes of Health was, look, we're going to give you all this money. You're not going to have it for peripheral projects and pet things over here. You're commanded to find cures. You're to spend all your money finding cures. And if you find a cure, we're going to celebrate like heck, of course, but we're also going to um, re realize countless trillions of dollars in savings in healthcare going forward. And so it's money very well spent. It's an awful lot of money, but it's something that every American should be very proud of that we're doing. Because sometimes you wonder where your taxpayers are going, tax dollars are going. They're going to a darn good thing on this one. Congressman, the next question comes from Jim from Manlius. Uh, he has a question about the emoluments clause. You're, you're a lawyer, right? You got, the, oh got this one? I'll, I'll put it in plain English. That's a fancy term for basically saying the president cannot receive foreign payments while in office. Now, one thing that distinguishes us up until now anyway from a banana republic is that you don't have to come in here and make payments, bribes, or make purchases from the president and his family members to get what you want or to conduct business if you're a foreigner. Um, president Trump continues to own many, many businesses which he has made a show of divesting himself of but hasn't completely done. Um, the Trump Hotel in Washington is one example where foreign dignitaries all clamor to stay at so they don't offend the president. His daughter can, has a job in the White House and continues to promote her brands, including her brands abroad, which were fast-tracked in China, I believe Japan, possibly elsewhere. Her husband's sister gave a talk recently in China where she was basically auctioning off U.S. citizenship on a fast-track basis to people who invested in one of her ventures or her brother's ventures. Um, I could go on and on because the president <coughs> has business interests all over the world. But do you feel that this is violation of the fancy term, the emoluments clause about foreign payments to the president, and why doesn't anybody care about it in Congress? <laughs> <laughs> We had, this, we had the same concerns with the previous administration when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State. <laughs> and her husband was re re receiving tons of money from places. I'm trying to. So, before, so, the bottom line is it's a persistent problem, okay? And it is something, it is a persistent problem that we need to look into. We are looking into it. 
people are looking at it, people are making noise about it, and yeah, I, it does concern me. Because any hint of impropriety at the highest levels, like it was Secretary of State or President, is a concern, of course. Of course. And so we have to, we have to do the best we can to ensure that. And I, I, I thought your question was very well formed. I thought you did a great job laying out your case, and it's a concern. Flat out, flat out, it's a concern. What are you doing about it? Pardon me? No one gets speeches about it. No one says anything about it. You just... <clears throat> I can tell you, you just gave a darn good short speech about it. Folks, good question about the emoluments clause. And thanks for the passion. Ma'am, ma'am, we need to go in the order we've asked people. That's right, and he just answered the question. Just had the congressman answer the Whether question. Whether you like the answer or not is something you can all decide yourself. You can. Megan, I think right. you're next. Right. Congressman, is there anything you'd like to add to that before we move on? I just, the, the only thing I'd like to add is that, look, uh, there's something that has to be looked into. That is being looked into as part of the whole investigation with the, Foreign, the Senate Intelligence Committee, and they're going to continue to do that stuff. House and Senate Intelligence Committees are going to continue to do that stuff. Okay. Congressman, I'm with John from Camillus. He has a question for Hi, you John. tonight. How are you? About veterans. I'm fine, thank you. Uh, thank you for being here, uh, Congressman. Uh, I also like to uh, thank you for your support of the uh, military veterans. My question has to do with our military veterans. Specifically, what do you see as the most pressing issues facing our military veterans, and how will you address those issues? Well, thank you, thank you John. There are a slew of issues facing our military veterans. And here's a cold, hard fact for you. By the time that this, this meeting is over, another veteran will have taken his life in this country. That's a cold hard fact. Veterans are committing suicide at a rate of almost one an hour. So think about that. One an hour. That's a national tragedy. And so we passed some legislation to try and fix that. As one example of the problems facing veterans, and this is infuriating. And it was a Clay Hunt Suicide Prevention Act. I'm very proud of it, I'm very happy with it. It went to President Obama's desk and he happily signed it, as well he should. They set up hotlines across this country for people to call in, veterans that were suicidal. They were put on hold and they were asked to leave messages <clears throat> and we get back to you. And many of those people ended up committing suicide. That is a disgrace in this country, okay? That's one example of some of the problems that beset the treatment of veterans in this country. I think we have a solemn responsibility from the moment they put on the uniform until the moment they take their last breath on earth, earth to look after them. And here's, thank you. <clears throat> it's a fact that an awful lot of veterans are coming back from Afghanistan and uh, uh, Iraq and uh, they have a substantial PTSD. So we've done a lot to beef up funding for, for mental health uh, research and mental health treatment for veterans. We've done, we've done some things to make the Veterans Administration far more accountable than it used to be. Uh, if you're in the Veterans Administration now, you're not just going to get a pass if you have misconduct, you're going to be gone. We're, gonna, we're demanding performance, we're demanding uh, the fixes. Another one is a good example is uh, veterans that live more than 40 miles from a veterans facility now have the option of just going and getting, uh, getting health treatment anywhere. Okay? And that's a good thing. It's got some problems with the act, but it's better than it was. And they're getting more things. There is some problems with you, right. Yeah. But the, the bottom line is, there has been a slew of legislation to try and make things better, but you know what? We failed our veterans in many ways. When people lose limbs and people you know, sacrifice their lives so we can come and you can protest, and some people get mad at me, that's our, you're right as Americans, and I applaud that. Mm -hmm. And 1.2 million Americans in, in this country have died since the inception of our country, so you have that right. And we have failed them. So we have to do everything we can to make things better. We've been plussing up funding, funding for the military, and a lot of it's going towards veterans funding, and we've got to do that as well, and we're going to continue to do those things. And I have a veterans, uh, uh, veterans uh, committee in my district, and I meet with veterans, and we work, we work together to try and identify the issues that are problems. There's wonderful organizations like ClearPath 
for veterans, which, which deals with, helps, deals with veterans' issues with PTSD, and the whole, they, they really uh, developed this whole guide dog and comfort dogs that's taking, taking cat fire uh, nationwide. So there's a lot of good things happening. We need to do more. We need Con to do more. Congressman, uh, I want to ask this side, the whole room. Anybody got 111, the number 111? Right here. Right here. Where are you? Okay. Your next question. <clears throat> I didn't have time to grab your name, so why don't you tell the congressman who you, who you are, where you're from. My name's Philip Buff. I'm from Fabius. You'll have to excuse me. I have to read from prepared notes. That's quite all right. Uh, I'm not challenging your religious faith. However, I do have a question as it regards your legislative agenda. Mm -hmm. The question is, you have stated that your Catholic faith dictates your legislative agenda regarding abortion, with the exception of rape and incest. And However, the life of the mother. Uh, excuse me? And the life of the mother. So then why don't your religious beliefs then compel you to fight for universal health care, which even the Pope deems as a right, not a privilege? <laughs> I, I get asked, I get asked sort of that question, not in a religious vein, but I get the, the question about a single payer health plan. You can sit down. Thank you for the question. Um, I, uh, I don't believe in this country that a single payer health plan will work. Period. Okay? What separates our economy from most of the economies of the rest of the world and what made us the biggest, best economy the world has ever seen is that it's a free market economy. Right? So, in my opinion, and just my position, and you can disagree with me one, and I completely respect that, and I respect your position too, for sure. But my opinion is that we've experimented with this with the Affordable Care Act, and we have places like Iowa where 54 out of 59, let me finish please, 54 out of 59 counties have no insurance carry right now. Okay, so it's not working. So, my, it, well, let me tell you what I would like to do, okay? And why I felt that this, this repeal fell far short of anything that what might possibly work. Because I made a commitment to you and everyone in this room when I was elected in 2014 that I would never vote for a repeal of the Affordable Care Act as much as I think it wasn't a good idea unless or until a re full replacement was ready to go. Okay? And that's in contrast with many of my brethren. Uh, my brother and sister is in the Republican Party. But the bottom line is this. Here's what I think we needed to do. That repealed all the funding mechanisms of the Affordable Care Act. Okay? It replaced it with tax credits that uh, probably are not anywhere near sufficient for people buying insurance. It's cut $7 billion in Medicaid payments to New York State alone, which is a gut shot to middle class taxpayers. What I think we could do, in addition to all that, and what we need to do, is do the things that are going to drive costs down. Who here is sick of the prescription drug prices in this country? Yeah. yeah. Right? Okay? Yeah. Let me finish. Okay? That will, drive, that will drive costs down. Who would like to see interstate competition for health care? Who would like to see tort reform? Who would like to see, a lot of us would, and I believe these things are the drivers, okay? That will, but unless you have a full replacement and you get, get it back to a market facing and create competition that keeps the cost down, that you're never going to have it. Not pre birth, but after birth, with universal health care, it's an obligation that we have. <clears throat> it's not market based. <laughs> I happen to believe that the market base will work. Reasonable people can disagree, and I respect your opinion, and I respect your rationale. I'm not asking respect mine, I'm just giving you what my, what my position is. I've got to ask if there is a, a number 89. Do we have a number 89? We were looking for one. We do have one. You've said no. Okay. Well, we'll pass your time off gladly to the next person. Thank you, ma'am. Congressman, we're, we're going to bring you another question from social media sure. tonight. This is from Marsha, who posted to Facebook, saying, how can we stop this negativity in our government? Certainly you, certainly you can see that there's been a lot of frustration and anger here tonight. What's your response to, to Marsha? Yeah, listen, I don't believe there's anger. They, people have passion, and I totally respect that, and I totally embrace it. I got it. 
not everyone's going to agree with what I have to say. And that's your right as Americans, express yourselves. I'm, I'm cool with that. That's fine. So it's, doesn't, that doesn't bother me. I don't, I don't think that's anger. That you're, you're, you're doing what, God, what makes our country great. But I'm sorry, the, the, Megan. The, the nature of the question, again, I'm sorry, I got off track, I'm sorry. She asked, how can we stop this negativity in our government? Well, I can tell you, and I'll put my money where my mouth is with this, okay? There's a group of about 20 Republicans and a group of about 20 Democrats that meet on a regular basis. And we always make sure we have an even number of Republicans, an even number of Democrats that are committed to trying to work in a bipartisan manner. I'm one of those people, all right? And we meet on a weekly basis. And there are some things we know we're not going to agree on, like, for example, a single-payer health care system as opposed to market-based. But instead of, instead of getting frustrated and mad at each other, we try and figure out where we, can, where we can find common ground. And let me give you an example, okay? There's a lot of talk about tax reform right now, right? And a lot of talk about the tax reform could jumpstart the economy, could bring a lot of money back from overseas. Probably trillions, there's trillions of dollars that are overseas that used to be here, right? And we could bring that money back and maybe use that money for infrastructure. So we as a group have made a statement to say, we think tax reform should be coupled with infrastructure, uh, an infrastructure bill, so we can do both tax reform and infrastructure. We, the bipartisan members. Now, whether you guys want to believe me or not, um, I am still considered one of the most bipartisan independent members in Congress. I have more bills passed last term than any freshman in the history of our country, okay? And every single bill, the very first co-sponsor, the lead co-sponsor, was a Democrat, okay? That's how you lead. That's how you get through this partisan gridlock. And that's how you stop this, this uh, banging from both sides. Because both sides have got to accept the fact that we're not always going to agree on everything. And both sides are not going to have to accept the fact you have to compromise. The art of compromise has been lost. For God's sakes, Ronald Reagan a hardcore conservative, and Tip O'Neill, a hardcore liberal, got together and did some pretty landmark things. They fixed Social Security for a generation, and they did tax reform. That's the last time we did tax reform. It can happen, it will happen, and I'm going to try and want to be at the forefront of trying to make that happen. Congressman, we head back to the audience now. Marilyn from Marietta has a question for you about uh, prescription drugs. Sure. Hi. I, um, I'm concerned about health care, obviously, as everyone else is. And you said people are angry here. And I think part of the problem is also that we are frightened. And people yes. are frightened that we won't have enough money to pay for it. We won't have the coverage that we need. We'll have caps and so forth. And I know in your letter to the Post Standard yesterday, you talked about the market um, reforms. And you touched on some mm -hmm. of them. And I think that going along with the health care, the cost of prescription drugs, as you mentioned, is a huge problem, another frightening thing for seniors. And what are some of the things that can be done? Can, can there be some agreement to allow Medicare and Medicaid to negotiate drug prices the way the Veterans Administration yeah. does? Can the, can the profits that these companies are making be restricted in some way? I, what can be done with the cost of drugs? Okay, thank you very much. And it's a great question. That's one of the things. <laughs> and you picked up on one of the things I talked about when I say what are the things, things we need to do to make healthcare more affordable and get insurance prices down. Prescription drugs is a key component of that. Absolutely, we should try and figure out a way to negotiate better drug prices. Absolutely. I mean, I don't know if you've heard about this, but my, first of all, my mom and dad, my father has Alzheimer's, my mother has some health issues as well. We've, it's amazing what, how much money they have to spend on, on prescription drugs. It's crazy. It's crazy. And uh, we, have, we, have, we have seniors who have to get on buses to go to Canada to buy their medicine. This is America. It's crazy, right? So I totally agree that we should absolutely negotiate prescription drug prices. Absolutely. We've got to do that. And we've got to create more competition as best we can. Absolutely. And I think that uh, um, I'm open to other suggestions as well. Because I, in my mind, that's one of the big, big cost drivers of healthcare nowadays is exorbitant prices. It is. Congressman, uh, we don't have time for more questions. And I know that means that folks here are going to feel like they came up short. How many people here would like to see another town hall meeting soon? Yeah. Yeah. Me too. 
We, we, certainly, we certainly respect, uh, you've, you've been a great audience tonight. You've had well-considered questions. We would have loved to have gotten to all of them tonight. Before we fully wrap up, though, we're going to give the Congressman uh, about a minute to give us a closing thought before we're done for the night. So, Congressman, a, a final a minute or so. Thank you. I, I want to thank uh, uh, CNY Central. You know, think about it. That's, that's right. This is an hour of airtime with no commercials. That's, that's a lot of money for them, and I appreciate what they did to try and let us take part in this modern experiment in, in uh, democracy. Listen, I learned from you all, okay? And I appreciate the fact that you feel differently than me and you're passionate about things. That's great, okay? And, I, and we're gonna continue to have these conversations. I'm happy to have more of these. I thought it was very well done, and I appreciate everything everyone did to come here tonight to offer their opinions, okay? This is America, okay? This is democracy in action. And our forefathers set up a great country, a great country, where you were allowed to, to voice your opinion. You were allowed to say when you're pissed off at somebody. That's great. And I love to hear it because it, it, it makes me a stronger and a better leader. And listen, sometimes I don't always like the science outside my office with me dressed in a dunce hat and all that, but that's okay. That's your right. And that's your, that's, that's your, 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 your educating me is to, is to other, other points of view. And that's fine. But the bottom line is this is a great country and we got to continue this dialogue going forward. I've had tons of telephone town halls. I've had Facebook Live. I've had uh, Google Hangouts. I've had town halls that are subject based like on heroin, which is killing our kids. And I'd like to talk more about that next time and many other things. And I'm going to continue to make myself Congressman, available. Thank you. One thank thing you we can't much. do is go into prime time. Are you, ready to, are you ready to announce another town hall tonight? I don't have a date, but we definitely will do some more. How about, how about tomorrow? You ready for tomorrow? <laughs> thank you, Congressman, very much. Thank you, guys, thank very, you much. very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Thank, Thank you to everybody much. watching tonight. Right. Thank you, Congressman, for our And we know home. the conversation is going to continue online on our Facebook page and at cnycentral.com. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Have a great night, everyone.